Well, these little fellas are tree bumblebees, except they're not living in a tree. They've actually moved into uh, one of the bird boxes in the garden. And, uh, yeah, they don't seem particularly aggressive. Uh, the ones bumbling around there... Um, Oh, uh, some bird just left the bird box there. It's, it's, they seem to get on uh, side by side quite happily. Yeah, as you can see, they're uh, they're all bumbling around quite happily, and uh, they are probably uh, mostly male bumblebees. There, probably uh, clustering round, waiting for the uh, virgin females to uh, emerge. But they they do appear uh, quite docile. Um, as though they've you know been smoking quite a lot of marijuana they begin to just bumble around kind of spliffed out of the head um, yeah pretty harmless um, don't seem to bother anybody um, I think the birds lot some of the birds come in the garden like eating them but the uh, the only thing they don't like is they don't like if you're hammering or banging on the wall nearby or uh, if I'm banging around inside the garage that tends to upset it I believe they are quite uh, sensitive to uh, low frequency vibration. So, uh, yeah, just a little bit careful. But, uh, yeah, it's really nice to have the bumblebees. They're really interesting. And uh, a lot of bumblebees in the UK are uh, endangered species. So uh, to have a little bit of wildlife is great. But that's not what today's video is about. It's going to be about... Um, repairing uh, one of my garden gates that's unfortunately fallen apart. So let's get on with that. Well hello everybody. Uh, this isn't going to be a welding video uh, but I just thought I would do something different this morning. Uh, I'm afraid my garden gate has been broken and uh, all the sheep seem to be uh, running into the garden and causing havoc as usual, little woolly tailed buggers. And, uh, so what I've decided to do is uh, have to fix my gate. Now I'm going to um, uh, do a little bit of a MIG weld. Now MIG weld isn't necessarily the best way to do this repair because um, it's quite windy outside and a MIG welder uses a shielding gas to stop the weld from oxidising. And so what tends to happen when you MIG weld outside, and especially on a windy day like it is today, the gas blows away and uh, that makes the weld oxidise which isn't great, it doesn't produce a very good weld but what I'm actually welding is just an old gate and as long as I can glue the two bits of metal together that's going to be good enough. Now I'm not going to give you uh, an introduction to MIG welding um, I probably wouldn't be capable, I have done quite a lot of MIG welding in the past but it's not really my thing, I much prefer to uh, TIG weld um, when I learnt to weld many years ago, it was, it was my grandfather that taught me, and it was using oxyacetylene. And when you use a, an oxyacetylene welder, you tend to have a kind of a big blowtorch, a gas torch, which is run off oxygen and acetylene, and you have a filler rod, which is just a piece of uh, rod. And what you do is, when you're trying to weld things together, you heat up the piece of metal that you're trying to weld, and then you move in the filler rod. Uh, and that's how you do it. But uh, an, uh, a MIG welder, which stands for uh, metal inert gas, uh, what that uses is the filler wire, rather than holding it in your hand, it actually comes out the end of this torch. So this is the filler wire here, and when I pull the trigger, it comes out the gun. So this control on the, uh, on the welder, that controls the speed of the wire that it comes out. So I turn that control down, it comes out slowly, you can see that. And then I turn this control up, it comes out quickly. Now to melt the wire we don't actually use gas, we use an electricity. So basically this forms one of the electrodes. And the part that you want to weld, you clip this earth clamp onto. So, uh, I think this is general, I can't remember which way around it is, I think this is negative and this one is live. Depending on the type of materials that you're welding, sometimes you actually have to uh, swap the, the polarity of the electrodes over and for some materials you may even decide to weld with AC if you're doing non-ferrous and aluminium. But we're just going to be welding a piece of mild steel today. So, uh, just to recap, pull the trigger, wire comes out, we get a big spark off the end of here in the workpiece that we're trying to weld, that melts the wire. There's also gas coming out of this tube, but it's not heating gas, it's what I call the shrouding gas. So basically that's going to be a mixture of argon and CO2, 
and what that does is when we create the molten metal at the end of here it doesn't oxidise instantly and go all black and horrible. The shielding gas flows over the top of the molten metal until it cools down and that stops an oxide layer from forming so it keeps uh, our weld nice and clean. This, this tip that, I'm on, that I've just pulled off there, what this does, it just directs the flow of gas out of here and it also helps protect the, uh, the welding torch from all the back splatter that comes from the weld. So the other controls just say we've got these two voltage controls here, fine and coarse. These basically affect your welding current. If you're trying to weld a thick piece of metal, you turn this one up to the maximum setting. If you're trying to uh, weld a thin piece of metal, you turn it down. This one is just a fine adjust, so we've got coarse and fine. It says volts, but it really affects the welding current. We've got a switch on here, which is basically for spot welding. What, what happens when you engage the spot weld control? which I haven't used in many years, basically it automatically feeds the wire out and then stops so I'll turn that on and it'll feed it out hopefully that will stop soon and it stops automatically even though my finger's on the trigger so that's used for spot welding but we're not going to do, use that today so we're going to turn it off again so before we talked about the shield gas so the shield gas lives in this bottle and it's going to be a mixture of uh, CO2 and argon um, you don't particularly need that, you could just use uh, pure CO2 for what I'm welding today. But when I was uh, last doing some welding I was working on an old car that I was restoring and um, basically it, you get a much better weld if you use a mix of argon with CO2. But if you're just welding big thick stuff, uh, CO2 is normally fine but I'm not going to go out and buy a bottle of CO2 just to do this so we're using the last of the argon. Uh, I'm afraid these bottles are very nearly empty, there's just a little bit of uh, gas left in it. I'm just hoping there's going to be enough gas here to do the job. And to be honest, even if I run out of, the gas, run out of gas, I'm going to probably keep welding anyway because it's just not that critical what I'm doing. The, uh, we talked about the welding, the filler wire before, so that lives on this big reel here. So the, uh, this reel is driven by an electric motor, which is, is here. So when I pull this trigger, it will start up this electric motor, it will pull this wire off the spool, it goes all the way down this long flexible cord and it comes out the end of my gun. So basically I'm just going to press a button and you'll see it start to feed through. See that? And when I take my finger off the trigger, it stops. Put my finger on the trigger and press it again. And it starts and if I turn the speed up it's going to go faster. If I turn it down, it's going to go slower. Now, the way that the MIG welder feeds the wire is there's two rollers here, and the wire is pinched between the rollers. Now, what this control does, this affects the pressure of those two rollers, because if you're welding and the, um, the welder jams up, what can happen is that this mechanism can have so much force it can pull wire through and it can jam up inside the, uh, the hose and inside the gun and make a mess of everything so basically you have to set this tension control so there's just enough um, force, just enough tension on those rollers to feed the wire through the gun but not enough tension that it's all going to jam up so there was my useless and crap guide to MIG welding well you can see here this is the part that's broken off and uh, I'm doing a voiceover because it was just really windy outside and uh, I don't know how this handle's broken off because it was welded on really with a, a lot of weld uh, it must have been on 20 years so uh, yeah don't know why it decided to fall off but it did so uh, I'm just grinding away the old weld there and some of the rust um, the weld was um, where, where the actual handle had fallen off it was actually really rusty which tells me that uh, that weld must have cracked um, a long time ago and finally just given up the ghost recently when the handle fell off in somebody's hand so uh, I'm, I'm just grinding away get back to some uh, fresh base metal and then we're going to uh, weld that handle back on Now I'm just actually grinding the handle part now because again that's just got years of accumulated um, paint on it 
and also lots of the uh, rusty old weld that was that had previously failed. I think when this was built the first time, it was probably stick welded rather than MIG welded because there was a lot of the old flux residue still on a lot of the joints as I was grinding it away. I just wanted to try and create a little bit of a flat area on the uh, on on the shaft um, because obviously it's round and. Uh, Trying to uh, weld something square onto an object that's round is can be a bit tricky. So I, I've just ground a little bit of a flat area on it, and uh, yeah, I'm just again I'm just grinding the handle there again just to make it um, um, go onto the rod a little bit better. Yep. Yeah, okay. You can see I've uh, I've ground off the old weld and cleaned up a little bit around it. Um, when you are welding it's worth actually grinding quite a long way from the um, spot that you're actually welding because when you heat everything up you'll find that the paint and any uh, old oils and grease they'll start to come out of the metal and they'll run into your weld and contaminate it. Um, although of course we don't really get care for this repair um, I actually do come from um, kind of a fabrication background although I, basically I did the electronics for a company that built machines and um, yeah there was a lot of heavy fabrication so I got to learn a lot working with um, platers and welders um, although those guys actually knew what they were doing and uh, you know well I kind of know what I'm doing but I would class myself as kind of a farm welder you know, I can glue stuff together, but uh, I don't think British Nuclear Fuels are going to be asking me to weld any of their pipes anytime shortly. As I said earlier, I'm, uh, I'm MIG welding here, and uh, I don't really like MIG welding particularly. Um, I much prefer TIG welding. Okay, so that's the uh, that's the weld. It's not particularly pretty. Uh, a little bit of splatter because there was still some contamination. All right, okay, this is the bottom of the gate, which has got a big hole in it. And, uh, yeah, I'm sticking my finger in it now. And this metal is really thin and uh, there's it's kind of only the, um, the rust worms holding hands that are holding it together. Tin worms, yeah, that's it, tin worms. You have wood worms, uh, wood worm and tin worms, don't you? Okay, so we're going to have to clean all the uh, the rust and the old paint off, and uh, I'm just going to patch it up basically. Uh, or I've already done uh, quite a bit of patching there, and I've just basically um, cut some pieces of sheet metal, and I'm just clamping them on there, and uh, effectively just sandwiching the um, rotten old metal inside, and just trying to stick some new metal around it doesn't have to be pretty, just have to be functional, just needs to keep the bloody sheep out of my garden. Okay, I've just marked off the final patch there, and uh, yeah, I've just got a guillotine in the garage, which uh, it, it cuts through this stuff really well. It's about two, two, two millimeters thick. The stuff that I'm uh, plating with there, and the main reason I'm using something to look two millimeters thick is it's because it's, uh, it's all I've got. Well, well, I hope you can, hopefully you'll be able to hear that. You, you, I'm just actually taking very short little tacks because the, uh, the metal I'm welding, the patches are only two mil thick, so that's relatively thin. And I'm trying to weld on uh, some, some pits of the parent metal behind it. It's quite a heavy section box, although to be honest it was completely rotted out. And what I found was, as I was welding, I just kept burning through. So just to stop burning through, I'm just I'm just welding little, effectively, lots of little spot welds. So I put a bit of weld on, let it cool down, then put another piece of weld on, and it just stops you burning well, through. And that's the uh, that's the thing pretty much finished. Yeah, not particularly pretty, but uh, agricultural and um, and good enough. You can maybe see the uh, lots of little spot wells there. 
Okay, I'm just cleaning off some of the surface ruts and rust and bits of splatter, and then I'm just going to give it a paint. Okay, that's the handle that we repaired, all welded. That's the handle cleaned up and just painted with some hammerite. That's our patch to the box section. Not too bad, not pretty, but good enough. And that's the gate, quite a long gate and quite a heavy gate, took some moving. Alright, thanks very much, that'll do.